friends, again, welcome you today. I'm very pleased to see all of you in this hall for this 19th winter meeting of the OSU Parliamentary Assembly. And we are delighted today to have with us President of Austria National Council, Wolfgang Sobotka, our great friend and a friend of the Parliamentary Assembly and great supporter of our work. Thank you very much for your hospitality. And uh, also, we are grateful to have here Deputy Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs of Albania, representing Albanian Chairmanship, Mr. Etienne Chafai. And uh, I think we already mentioned this morning how important it is to work very closely and hand in hand with chairmanship. And we all know their priorities, and it's a good opportunity to have uh, Deputy Minister here. And of course, one of the main hosts here, and a great personality who is cooperating very actively, very well, very efficiently with the Parliamentary Assembly, and it's reflected in all our activities. I'm not talking about our personal good relations with all of you and with me personally and with Roberto, our Secretary General Thomas Greminger, and thank you Thomas for your tireless work, also for strengthening that relations that we founded here in this assembly and we're trying to enhance it and make it more effective for our common cause. So, um, so dear, dear colleagues, after the presentations and inauguration speeches, inaugural speeches, we'll have a questions and answers session. We'll try to have it as long as possible and let's start. Now I'd like to ask Mr. Sobotka to deliver his introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, lieber George, sehr geehrter Herr Vorsitzender, lieber Generalsekretär, Herr Botschafter Gröminger, werte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, ich freue mich ganz besonders, Sie wieder in Wien begrüßen zu können. Das ist nun mal das 19. Mal und das zeigt, dass es eine gute Tradition hat, vom Wiener Boden aus auch das Jahr über Initiativen zu entfalten, die heute wie in der Vergangenheit und der Zukunft wichtiger denn je sind. Denn wenn wir uns die Krisenherde gerade im OSCD-Raum ansehen, dann verlangt es mehr denn je multilaterale Diskussionen und auch Lösungen herauszubringen. Die Herausforderungen sind mit Sicherheit komplexer geworden, sie sind globaler geworden und sie sind vor allem in der Frage, wie die Digitalisierung das letztendlich auch das politische Geschehen beeinflusst, in dieser Form auch sehr viel schneller geworden. Die Themen der Cybersicht, Cybersicherheit, das Thema der hybriden Bedrohungen, Terrorismus, gewalttätiger Extremismus und Radikalisierung. Wir sind noch immer sehr geschockt vom Mord, der heute in der Nacht in Hanau uns alle erschüttert hat, wo es wieder vermutet wird, dass es ein politischer, ein rechtsextremer Hintergrund dazu geführt hat. Demokratie und Rechtsstaatlichkeit, die Fundamente für unsere Demokratien, um sie mit den Menschenrechten in Vereinbarung zu bringen und in Konkordanz zu bringen, stehen weltweit unter Druck. Einzelne Staaten können diese Herausforderungen mit Sicherheit nicht in dem Maße bewältigen, wie es die Bevölkerung von ihnen nach erwarten würde. Daher ist diese Zusammenarbeit, die multilaterale Zusammenarbeit wichtiger denn je und dazu gehören die Foren der OSCE. Die Zusammenarbeit auf der interparlamentarischen Ebene ist deshalb für mich so wichtig, weil die Abgeordneten die Bürger repräsentieren. Sie alle wissen, wo die Menschen der Schuh drückt, was ihre direkten Anliegen sind, die sie aus ihren Wahlkreisen mitnehmen, die sie in ihren Ausschüssen und in ihren Parlamenten diskutieren und sie wissen, wo wirklich die Menschen eine große Sehnsucht haben, dass ihr Wohlstand, ihre Lebensqualität verbessert wird. Greifen wir nur das Thema der Terrorismus, Terrorismusbekämpfung heraus. 
Und es zeigt sich, dass sich dabei wirklich alle relevanten Organisationen nun mehr an einem Strang befinden und gemeinsam hier vorgehen. Das ist die Interparlamentarische Union, die IPO, das ist die Versammlung der OSCD und das ist die UNO mit ihrem Büro für Terrorbekämpfung. Und Wien als internationaler Standort ist hier sehr gut platziert, ein Standort, der vernetzt und der den Dialog fördert. Und deshalb ist auch die Parlamentarische Versammlung der OECD so ein wesentliches Forum, das Gespräch im Fluss zu halten. Die gegenseitigen Meinungsaustausch zwischen West und Ost, ja aber auch zwischen Europa und den Partnerländern an den Rändern. Wenn wir an Nordafrika denken, wenn wir an den Nahen Mittleren Osten denken, und daher freut es mich, dass Delegationen aus Marokko und aus Israel heute unsere Gäste sind. Sie zeigen damit, dass die OSD gerade in diesen angrenzenden Räumen auch eine wesentliche Bedeutung hat. Und wenn wir als Gesamtheit auch dafür für Sicherheit und diese Kooperation stehen, dann ist es notwendig, auch diese Grenzen darin gehend zu öffnen. Die Parlamentarier ergänzen mit ihrer Arbeit ganz wesentlich die Arbeit der Regierungen und der Präsidenten. Und daher gratuliere ich auch sehr herzlich der Slowakei für ihre ambitionierte Präsidentschaft im abgelaufenen Jahr 2019 und wünsche vor allem Albanien in seiner Vorsitzführung das Beste. Es ist sein erster Vorsitz von Albanien und wissen, wir wissen, welche Herausforderungen Albanien kämpft und wie sie sich anstrengt, auch hier Fortschritte zu erzielen und im diplomatischen Wege auch viele Erfolge vorzuweisen versteht. Die größte Herausforderung bleibt nach wie vor unsere Krisensituation in dem Raum der Ukraine und Russland dementsprechend nicht nur anzusprechen, sondern auch im Gespräch Lösungen durchzuführen. Sie kennen die verschiedensten Notwendigkeiten, die sich daraus ergeben und die großen Anstrengungen, die auch die Europäische Union dabei unternimmt. Erfolg wird aber nur dann zu verzeichnen sein, wenn der Minsker Prozess wirklich vorankommt und der hängt davon ab, wie sich die einzelnen Konfliktparteien letzten Endes aufeinander zu bewegen und wir vernehmen deutlich eine Verbesserung der Waffenstillstand, der Gefangenenaustausch und ich darf Ihnen ein ganz persönliches Momentum erzählen. Wir hatten zehn Kinder, Waisenkinder aus Kiew und zehn Kinder, Waisenkinder aus Russland eingeladen. Im Vorjahr war es noch nicht möglich, auch hier Botschafter aufeinander zuzugehen zu sehen. Heute im heutigen Jahr, zu meiner großen Freude, haben sich die beiden Botschafter blendend unterhalten und gemeinsam mit diesen Kindern auch diesen kurzen Ausflug letzten Endes zu einem Erlebnis für sie gemacht, zu einem völkerverbindenden Erlebnis gemacht. Und Österreich hat hier gerade eine ganz besondere Verpflichtung, denn uns hat nach den Schrecken des Zweiten Weltkrieges und des Horror des Naziregimes die internationale Gemeinschaft sehr, sehr geholfen. Da sind österreichische Kinder nach Dänemark gebracht worden, in die Schweiz und in andere europäische Länder und wurden dort aufgenommen, um nach den Willen des Krieges diesen Kindern auch eine Perspektive zu geben. Und daher ist es auch für uns eine Verpflichtung, das zu tun, um der nächsten Generation auch die Perspektive eines gemeinsamen Dialogs zu geben und schlussendlich auch nach gemeinsamen Lösungen zu suchen. Die Westbalkanländer standen, stehen und werden weiterhin im Fokus der OSCD stehen. Wo wir, glaube ich, seit den letzten 20 Jahren wirkungsvoll und verdienstvoll arbeiten konnten und viele dazu beigetragen haben, dass die Region sich stabilisiert hat. Ich glaube, die, letztendlich die Expertise der OSCD ist hier unverzichtbar, was vor allem die Festigung des Rechtsstaates, der Demokratie und der Meinungsfreiheit betrifft. Und äh, die Frage der Demokratie ist eine, die vieles nicht nur von den Parlamentariern abverlangt, sondern von der gesamten Bevölkerung. Und das erlernt sich nicht von einem Tag auf den anderen. Das ist ein Prozess. Und wir wissen das in Österreich in ganz besonderer Art und Weise. Wir hatten das einmal 1918 schon gestartet, 
mit nicht einem sehr großen Erfolg nach bereits wenigen Jahren. Und wir haben es nach 1945 wieder versucht, diesmal mit großem Erfolg und wir feiern deshalb auch mit einem großen Stolz ein 75-jähriges Jubiläum dieser Zweiten Republik. Wir gedenken aber dabei erstens den Ländern, die uns befreit haben. Wir sind auch unsere eigene Geschichte eingedenkt, dass wir nicht nur Opfer gewesen sind, sondern auch Täter gewesen sind in der Zeit des Nationalsozialismus. Und wir sind auch eingedenk jeder yeah, Nationen, insbesondere der USA, die uns mit ihren Hilfen durch den Marshallplan ganz wesentlich unterstützt haben und damit auf die Beine geholfen haben, dass die Demokratie, die ein zartes Pflänzchen gewesen ist, auch sich weiterentwickeln konnte. Auf den drei Säulen, wo heute die OSCD ruht, auf der politischen, auf der wirtschaftlichen und auf der menschlichen Dimension, die halten wir gerade, was Österreich anlangt, ganz für essentiell und kämpfen dafür, dass auch in anderen Ländern nach diesen Prinzipien vorgegangen wird. Denn die Menschenrechte brauchen dieses wirtschaftliche und dieses politische Fundament und daher gilt es, sie zu schützen, die Demokratie zu schützen und allen Gefahren der Demokratie, die aus den unterschiedlichsten Extremismen heraus sich entwickeln, wirklich entschieden den Kampf anzusagen. Mich freut es ganz besonders, dass wir auch morgen dieses Thema des Antisemitismus in der Diskussion hier im Panel auch einbringen konnten. Antisemitismus ist für Österreich und ich glaube auch für Deutschland eine historische, eine ganz eine wesentliche Verantwortung, alles zu tun, den auch in seinen Anfängen zu bekämpfen. Antisemitismus ist eine zutiefst antidemokratische Haltung. Und es ist nicht und es ist weit mehr als ein Vorurteil. Es ist eine Geisteshaltung, die den Juden als das Böse schlechthin adressiert und als Gegenbeispiel die gute Gesellschaft stellt. Eine Geisteshaltung, die in ihrer Dimension antidemokratisch ist und Deborah Lipstadt hat in ihren Forschungen festgehalten, Juden sind so etwas wie der Gradmesser einer Gesellschaft. Wer sie angreift, greift alle demokratischen und multikulturellen Werte an. Ich glaube, das ist heute aktueller denn je, wenn wir in verschiedensten europäischen Ländern uns die Situation ansehen. Und wir haben heute einen Antisemitismus, der sowohl aus der rechten Ecke kommt, der aus der linken Ecke vor allem antizionistisch agiert und der auch letzten Endes oftmals islamistisch determiniert ist. Ich darf noch mit dir, Herr Präsident, ganz herzlich danken, dass wir dieses Thema aufgreifen konnten. Und ich denke, dass die OECD gerade eine Plattform ist, wo wir uns darüber austauschen müssen und wo wir sehen, was wir können wir gemeinsam dagegen letzten Endes tun. Abschließend darf ich noch versichern, ich freue mich, dass auch unsere Parlamentarier so intensiv an der OECD-Konferenzen, an den diversesten Meetings teilnehmen, dass sich das österreichische Parlament intensiv in die parlamentarische Versammlung einbringt, heute und auch in den nächsten Jahren. Alles Gute für die Wintertagung. Dear President Sobotka, Secretary General Greminger, Deputy Minister Chafai, dear Ambassador Eagley, all ambassadors, fellow parliamentarians, distinguished guests, friends. Of course, it's with uh, great pleasure that I welcome you at the 19th winter meeting of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. And of course, uh, at the outset, I also would like to join our feelings and uh, I guess we are all appalled at the news what happened in Germany and our condolences goes to our German colleagues, German people, but to everybody. I think that's this tragedy again showed and it's a very clear sign that we have to redouble our efforts to tackle extremism, terrorism and radicalization. As our main 
forum bringing together such an important audience, the winter meeting has become an indispensable tradition of our assembly. And I would like to express my gratitude to President Sobotka and the Austrian Parliament for their support. I would also like to thank Secretary General Graminger for, for the OSCE's hospitality. I already told him and also on my personal basis what I think and uh, for this close cooperation that PA enjoys with you and all your staff. Dear friends, uh, less than two months into Albanian chairmanship, I welcome the priorities identified by Prime Minister Rama, and we look forward to working closely with his very able team into 2020. This year offers an opportunity to reflect on the purpose and power of this organization, particularly in these times of changes and upheavals. There are great challenges, but also great opportunities. This year will mark 75 years since the end of the Second War and 30 years since historic changes swept across Europe. When from Germany and the Baltics to the Caucasus, people demanded change. For many of us who lived either in the Soviet Union or Eastern Bloc countries, this was proof that no matter how strong a state seemed to be, it cannot survive if it is unresponsive to the overwhelming desire of its citizens. 30 years ago, our organization was challenged into the redefining itself. With the end of the Cold War, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe lost its fundamental purpose, but at the same time gained a new raison d'etre. Our predecessors understood the opportunity to build on the experiences and create an organization capable of managing the historic changes taking place in Europe. In 1999, in 1990, the Paris Summit envisioned, uh, envisioned um, a brighter future for our continent. In one optimistic voice, our leaders saw a new year of democracy, peace, and unity. In Copenhagen, the participating states agreed to formally recognize a number of human rights and fundamental freedoms. The historic changes of this era led to predictions about the inevitability of uh, democratic progress, and indeed 30 years on, much has changed, often for the better. Today, across Europe and around the world, there is much to be optimistic about. Technological and economic advancements have generally improved our standards of living, and with the new levels of global connectivity, we live on a planet that seems smaller than ever before. But we also see multiple crises, challenges, and demands to change, and for change. Protests and political instability have become hallmarks of this time. These are indications that difficulties linger on. Whether the challenges are economic, environmental, political, or security related, we are called upon to meet the expectations of our citizens who demand more than just promises and campaign slogans. We must therefore live up to their expectations through concrete achievements, including a peaceful resolution of the OEC areas conflicts, and to normalize the lives of millions of affected people. For instance, despite positive steps, we are yet to find a final comprehensive and durable settlement of the Transnistrian conflict. We fail to see meaningful progress to resolve the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. In the occupied territories of Georgia, creeping borderization, abductions, and illegal detentions continue to constitute severe violations of health principles and fundamental human rights. And of course, despite some timid steps to de-escalate the conflict, the war in Eastern Ukraine and the illegal annexation of Crimea have defined our work for more than five years now. The major problem is that even with a clear roadmap how to settle the conflict, the process is a hostage of geopolitical ambitions and suffers from a lack of genuine political will. 
Last week at the Munich Security Conference, we saw yet another attempt to identify concrete steps to settle these conflicts, which deserve to be followed up in good faith in a sense of collective responsibility. Our failure to put an end to the war in Ukraine and other calamities has made it more difficult to counter emerging transnational challenges that require a joint response. If it has contributed to a deepening divide between East and West at a time when what needed a deepening cooperation between all our countries on issues such as corruption, migration, terrorism, intolerance, and climate change. All of these have impacted our societies and revealed a sense of powerlessness among our governments and addressed them in a coherent way. And they come at a time when the transatlantic divide is becoming more pronounced. We see these divisions on display particularly when it comes to different approaches towards confronting, for instance, China's growing influence. <coughs> Meanwhile, uncertainty around Brexit and a prolonged EU enlargement process casts a shadow on the European promise and threatens to roll back hard-earned progress achieved in the Western Balkans. Developments in Syria and the broader Middle East have displayed rifts between regional powers and demonstrated the limits of ex exporting stability by military means. Renewed armed races between nuclear powers, the deterioration of confidence building measures, and arms control agreements threaten the survival of millions of ordinary people. So we must wonder what role for the OSCE now. In times when multilateralism is undermined, do we let this lead us into irrelevance? Or instead do we master the political will to find difficult compromises and provide once more the OIC with the resources to manage today's challenges? I believe this is part of the response because parliamentarians can best relay the concerns of the people our organization serves. Ladies and gentlemen, prominent voices have emerged in recent years calling for a review of the continent's security arrangements. In the face of the challenges I have outlined, we should keep an open mind and embrace the desire of high-level dialogue. We must remain steadfast in defense of the very foundations of European security. The principles enshrined in the Helsinki Final Act and our foundational documents cannot be compromised. Every country, regardless of its size or power, must respect the rules of the game. Legitimate interest must not be pursued with illegitimate means. Instead of tabula rasa and a completely new world order, we must work ever closely to complement our politically binded commitments with new standards addressing contemporary threats. In doing so, we should rely on the strength of the OEC and the ability to respond quickly to tackle emergencies. This hour depends on us to make the best use of this organization and what it stands for. Even when per particular governments or leaders disapprove with our critical views and activities, they should not use this as an excuse to intentionally weaken this organization. It's always better to follow more constructive approaches whenever possible. I have been serving the OIC for many years, working with the dedicated individuals in Vienna, Copenhagen, and in the field. And it's so inspiring to witness how many people have devoted to our common cause. Many of you have traveled from far away, including North America or Central Asia, and your robust participation highlights our collective belief in what the OSC can achieve. And I'm privileged to work with you, responsible leaders, both parliamentarians and staff, men and women from different generations and backgrounds who understand the importance of this endeavor. Let us keep in mind the purpose of the OSC and the responsibility we have to meet the expectations of our people. This is our tough but noble mission. Thank you very much.
now Deputy Minister Jeff Hyde, on behalf of Albanian Chairmanship. Thank you, dear President Saratelli, dear President Sobotka, dear Secretary General Greminger, dear Secretary General Montella, distinguished members of the Parliamentary Assembly. I'm honored to address this plenary session of the Parliamentary Assembly's winter meeting on behalf of the OSCE chairperson in office. This opportunity for an exchange of views on contemporary issues and challenges that we face together as an OSCE family has become a valuable and functional tradition, as President Sobotka said. F firstly, I would like to join the comments of President Saratelli in condemning the horrible events in Germany and in extending our condolences to our German colleagues. The OSCE Parliamentary Assembly and each of you members of this assembly have a critical role to play within the OSCE. The democratic legitimacy that you as elected officials bring to international affairs is exceptionally useful. And at the same time, it is a heavy responsibility as you can speak your minds as individuals and we would very much encourage you to do so. The OSCE welcomes your inputs that you bring to the table, dealing on a daily basis with the challenges and concerns of your constituents you also bring an important grounding to the organization, as well as your know-how from how much our work impacts the lives of people across the participating states. As a body that is not constrained by, consensus, by the consensus rule, the Parliamentary Assembly's ability to pass recommendations by majority vote can help to encourage forward movement also on difficult issues within the OSCE. As underlined by the Chair in Office, Prime Minister Rama, when addressing the Permanent Council, the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly is the OSCE structure that brings out the most plur plurality and diversity. The input and actions of parliamentarism are critical to the collective success of the OSCE. By connecting the organization to its citizens and our citizens to the organizations, by adding visibility to election observation and the consolidation of democracy in the OSCE region, by inspiring and modernizing the work of the OSCE through new approaches and original proposals. The work of the Albanian chairmanship, as, as outlined by the chairman in office, Prime Minister Rama, revolves around three main priorities. Making a difference on the ground, implementing our commitments together and building stability through dialogue. We're presently going through a complicated period in the world and difficulties and complexities surround the chairmanship and the entire OSCE family. But we're confident that with the perseverance of the OSCE participating states, the OSCE parliamentary assembly and the executive structures, we can secure sustainable achievements for the common good and the OSCE area in 2020. In this regard, we particularly value your support as parliamentarians to implement our priorities not, not only by building political support for the OSCE in your capitals, but also by advocating in attaining OSCE commitments by each participating state. As elected officials, you have not only a role but a responsibility for the implementation or by helping us hold your governments to account for the commitments undertaken. As was said here before, Progress is the prerogative of every chairmanship, but progress is something that we can only achieve together. I would like to recall that this year we marked the 30th anniversary of the Charter of Paris, an important moment to remember that democracy is the only system of government for our nations, and that human rights and fundamental freedoms are the birthright of all human beings. While their protection and promotion is the first responsibility of government, as lawmakers, only you can guarantee their, light, or their rights in law. The Albanian chairmanship will be paying close attention to the debates and intervention during this parliamentary assembly to be able to capitalize on the ideas and inputs that the members bring to the fore. I will note that the priority topics to be addressed within the three OSCE uh, Parliamentary Assembly Committees over the next two days demonstrate not only the relevance of parliamentary work in international affairs and the OSCE, but also a full alignment with the Albanian Chairmanship priorities for 2020. The Chairmanship's motto of implementing our commitments together is not only guiding our work, but is also an appeal. OSCE commitments are relevant to all of our countries. 
and I hope that you will all return to our parliaments with renewed energy and dedication to implement our commitment everywhere across the OC. We can all tackle the modern issues and challenges that all of our countries face individually, but only together can we find solution and overcome the crisis. And the Albanian Chairmanship firmly believes that we can and will do much more together this year. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask uh, Secretary General of the OEC, Ambassador Thomas Graminger, to deliver his speech. Please, Thomas. Excellencies, distinguished members of the OEC Parliamentary Assembly, colleagues, it's my pleasure to address this distinguished meeting and to give you my sense of where we stand at the present juncture. But at the outset, let me first express my sincere appreciation for the work of the OEC Parliamentary Assembly. OEC parliamentarians add genuine value to the efforts of governments and OEC institutions. First, you are experts in projecting the OEC and the principles and commitments we stand for both in your own countries and on the international stage. Second, you add significant expertise and visibility to OEC election observation missions, most recently in Belarus, Uzbekistan, and Azerbaijan. And third, your active participation in OEC meetings, such as the anti-Semitism conference uh, on the 5th of February, or last week's regional meeting on foreign terrorist fighters is priceless and is much appreciated. Meanwhile, your own meetings excel as venues for open and frank discussions. The annual winner meeting, which draws the entire OEC family together, is a prime example. So, thank you. Thank you for making the journey and for engaging with us in the way you do. And in particular, I'm grateful to the for the excellent cooperation we continue to enjoy with uh, President Zeratelli, uh, with Secretary General Montella, and with the Vienna Liaison Office under Ambassador Montella. Distinguished members of the Parliamentary Assembly, what binds us together is our commitment, our commitment to shared principles, our aspiration to promote human rights and fundamental values, our responsibility to prevent and resolve conflicts, and our duty to ensure security for all OEC participating states and their individual citizens. Yet, our common security is under threat. Divisions within our societies and between our countries are multiplying. Confrontation is replacing cooperation and we continue to suffer from armed conflict within our own region. Arms control regimes are crumbling, adding to insecurity and uncertainty. Transnational threats are growing in intensity and global challenges are increasing security risks everywhere. In the words of Germany's federal president Frank-Walter Steinmeier at the opening of the Munich Security Conference last week, and I quote him, Every year, we are getting further and further away from our goal of creating a more peaceful world through international cooperation, end of quote. So, the situation is dire and the outlook, outlook uncertain, to say the least. What then can we do to make matters better? Allow me to share a few suggestions with you. First, we need to promote cooperative approaches, and we need to restore trust in effective multilateral institutions. Simply standing by and watching as more and more states start focusing on narrow parochial interests at the expense of the common good can have dangerous consequences. So we need to step up our public diplomacy in defense of multilateralism and in defense of cooperative security. 
I do see the Parliamentary Assembly as an important ally in communicating the positive impact of multilateral organizations vis-a-vis -vis governance, vis-a-vis -vis the civil society, and vis-a-vis -vis the wider uh, public. We also need to continuously modernize and adapt our toolbox to ensure that our organization remains fit for purpose in a fluid and increasingly complex security environment. This includes greater readiness for preventive action, and I'm fully committed to pursuing further efforts in this regard. Second, we need to expand the space for dialogue, which has been shrinking rapidly. For instance, the structured dialogue has been a good start. As a fully complementary track to established OEC formats, it has produced useful exchanges on threat perceptions, on force postures, on military doctrine. It has promoted urgently needed military to military contacts. It started discussions on practical steps to reduce military risks by addressing prevention and management of military incidents or by proposing voluntary transparency measures uh, on military uh, exercises. Beyond this flagship initiative, we need to make full use of the potential for fostering dialogue in other areas of comprehensive security. In fighting transnational threats, in building confidence in the economic and environmental sphere, in promoting rights-based approaches to the many interconnected challenges we face today. It has been refers to, referred to this year's anniversary of the Paris Charter, the Astana Declaration, and the Vienna, the Bonn, and the Copenhagen documents afford us many opportunities to reconnect with some of our most fundamental OEC commitments. Let us use these anniversaries creatively to look forward in the interest of rebuilding trust and reinvigorating these concepts. Third, it is vital that we grasp every opportunity to achieve a peaceful resolution to the crisis in around Ukraine. There now is a window of opportunity to secure further substantive results towards uh, implementing the Minsk agreements. Chairperson in office Rama and President Zeretelli both have been to Kiev uh, recently to reinforce our firm commitment to supporting the process through the Trilateral Contact Group and through the OEC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine. I myself am planning to travel to Kiev and, and the Donbas soon. So, let us work together to maintain the current momentum. In parallel, we also need to intensify our efforts to work together constructively in all other mediation formats, in relation to the Transnistrian settlement process and in relation to the formats for the South Caucasus. Fourth, intensifying our partnerships and open, opening up new avenues for cooperation is a necessity. It is the best way to make efficient use of limited resources, leverage synergies, and boost our collective impact. I was very pleased to see that the Parliamentary Assembly, Assembly recently signed an MOU with the UN Office for Countering Terrorism. I'm confident this step will strengthen our overall very good relationship with UNOCT. And this is but one example of our expanding external relationships on critical security issues. Partnerships also enable us to exchange ideas and help us to develop our own thinking on the security impact of global challenges such as climate change or migration. And we, the OEC, should be part of this global conversation and add the security perspective to it. You, the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, you have a track record of highlighting emerging issues and introducing them to the OEC agenda. In the past, on issues like combating trafficking in human beings, for instance. I have taken note that the Parliamentary Assembly has been paying increasing attention to digitalization and to new technologies, which are beginning to raise critical governance and security issues. I agree 
that it is time for us to reach out on these issues, including in partnership with the private sector, to identify risks and threats as well as opportunities. We are already successfully doing this as a member of the advisory board of Tech Against Trafficking, an initiative created by leading tech companies committed to preventing human trafficking. We are currently exploring other possibilities for multi-stakeholder initiatives to address this crucial nexus between technology and security. Dear colleagues, despite the many challenges facing our region, there is no need to despair. We have many avenues for pushing for a positive change. And the, indeed, we have a duty to encourage an enabling environment and to seize opportunities together. Before closing, there are two more issues close to my heart that I would want to mention uh, today. The first is about gender equality. The 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action this year provide us with key milestones that can act as catalysts for our own action. And the third OEC Gender Equality Review Conference in June will be an important moment for all of us. Further focused efforts are needed to make OEC structures and all OEC activities fully gender sensitive and gender responsive. And I'm personally fully committed to this objective. And the second issue relates to the availability of appropriate human and financial resources to this organization. Ladies and gentlemen, zero normal growth for the unified budget is not sustainable. You cannot, over a long period of time, do more with less, despite of all our efforts to create efficiencies. The current OEC Chair's proposal, if adopted, would avoid this repeat scenario, even by a relatively small margin, but it would clearly be a step in the right direction. So I would like all of you, uh, for your support, to make this happen this year. This would help to ensure that the OEC will continue to be able to fulfill its mandated tasks. So, thank you for your support for our organization and for all your good work to advance the principles that the OEC stands for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear Thomas, indeed, uh, was very insightful speech, uh, sharing with us your priorities, your plans, your work, and of course, understanding value of parliamentarians' contribution and, and uh, the work we are doing together. And we appreciate very much this level of cooperation that we have at this moment with the uh, with you, with your colleagues, with the Permanent Council, and it's only for the benefit of our common work and common goals. So uh, thanks to all our speakers, and now I'd like to move to another, uh, let's say, part, and I think it's a very interesting part too, the questions and answers. And of course, I'd like to ask you all to keep your questions quite short, and they have to two minutes, I don't know, no more, and we have currently six speakers in the list, and the list is closed. So the first, Mr. Askar Shakirov from Kazakhstan, please. Thank you, President Seretelli, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me congratulate our colleagues from Albania on assuming the 2020 OEC chairmanship and wish every success in the course of the year. We are grateful to Slovakia and personally to Minister Lajcak, previous chair in office, for his attention to the Central Asia region during the Slovak chairmanship. Kazakhstan considers the OEC as an important component of global security architecture. 
The main priority for us in, the, in this organization is promoting the Astana Declaration as a comprehensive document defining the objectives of the OSCE. As you know, Kazakhstan is going through historical changes. Our country, country demonstrated to the world a peaceful and constitutional transition of power, which was respected by international partners. President Kasim Jomar Tukayev is well known in the parliamentary community. For a long time, he headed Kazakhstan's delegation to the OECPA and was elected vice president of the assembly. Nowadays, under his initiative, Kazakhstan is implementing important political and democratic reforms. We are committed to the principle of the hearing state that implies a constant dialogue between state authorities and people. We established the National Council of Public Trust that includes more than 40 representatives of civil society, public activists, political scientists and experts. A new law on peaceful assembly is being developed. It will introduce the notification principle of organizing public rallies. In order to strengthen multi-party system and political com competition, the threshold for party re registration will decrease two times. The rights of parliamentary opposition will be fixed in national legislation. In this regard, <coughs> we implemented fundamental reform of criminal law. In this regard, uh, our uh, penitentiary system is being reformed. Prison uh, population has dropped dramatically within the last 10 years. So in the world ranking, Kazakhstan moved from third to 100th place. 12 prisons were closed. National preventive mechanism on tortures in Kazakhstan became an excellent example of interaction between government bodies and civil society, as well as one of the most effective ways of public control over closed institutions. Kazakhstan intends to join the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, aiming at abolition of the death penalty. Furthermore, since 1st January of this year, Kazakhstan became the 50th member state of the Group of States Against Corruption, Greco. The Council of Europe is considering opening its real office in Kazakhstan. Ladies and gentlemen, Kazakhstan makes its valuable contribution to the development of the parliamentary dimension. <clears throat> in June this year, our capital will host the parliamentary conference of the World Trade Organization, WTO. It is jointly organized by the Parliament of Kazakhstan, Inter-Parliamentary Union, sure, and very sure, the European sure. Parliament. Thank you very much for your attention. No, I'm very sorry I did not interrupt you, but did not interrupt you. But look, we have questions here, and tomorrow will be time for different remarks, so we can use that time. And and, and uh, I'd like to ask all our colleagues to colleagues to put forward questions at this moment. Thank you very much for your information, but I think another will be question now coming up from the hall. Uh, Victor Dobre, please. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for Secretary General Thomas Griminger. We've been very to say, do you plan to set up a structure assigned for reflection process on the future of organization. I mean a structure that shall advance to the OCCA high officials proposal mean to reshape or streamline the OCCA to adopt to adapt it to the new emergency challenges. I know that the, that in the OCCA the panel of eminent persons had a few years ago a comparable approach with the above described one. My question is uh, occurring in the context of similar ongoing process with the OCCA Parliamentary Assembly in the last two years and the opinion that the success of the OCCA Parliamentary Assembly is mostly quali uh, qualified into the efficiency of the OCCA, a communication with a such a sign, sister bodies, 
might be beneficial for both organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Victor. Uh, another question from Finland. Uh, Wilhelm Kunila, please. Mr. Chairperson, distinguished president, dear colleagues, I have questions for Deputy Minister of Europe and Foreign Affairs of Albania, Mr. Xafai, representing the OSCE chairmanship. As you are all well aware, the European Commission has unveiled guidelines designed to mitigate risks arising from 5G technology. However, they have stopped short of imposing restrictions over high-risk providers. We are seeing hints of limitations, but few actual prohibitions. Many participating states are currently undergoing thorough discussions on how to tackle this security issue. They are wondering what is the smartest way to secure the network, how to protect the intellectual property rights, and how to lessen the dependence on suppliers. We certainly need stricter access control. For example, my country of Finland may be known for Nokia, but it is a non-European company that is building a 5G network for two of our main telecommunication companies. This is in contrast to Albania, which has withdrawn from a certain 5G technology project, citing cybersecurity concerns. Do you think these risks can be collectively managed by participating states, or how do you think we should proceed to guarantee provider independence from foreign government influence? Do you agree that providers should be subject to independent judicial revive? There should be no disregard for security of our precious data. We should not take unnecessary risks, especially those that could be avoided. What is your opinion? Are we too naive on this important issue? Thank you. Thank you, dear Wilhelm. Uh, question from Heidi Fry, Canada. Thank you, President. Um, my question is for the Secretary General of the OSCE, Thomas. Um, you committed uh, in Bratislava in December that you would make gender priority equality here to assure you said it in your speech again, uh, that you would bring about leadership in terms of gender, that you would look at transparency, uh, and that you would implement a safe workplace. So my question is this. I know December is not wasn't very long ago and you can't achieve all those things in two months. But I want to ask you, very, you, you did participate in a survey on sexual harassment with the United Nations in November 2018, but that, is, that result has not been available. I wanted to know if it could be made available to us. Uh, and secondly, I want to know what you see the challenges, because you have achieved enormous parity. You have, what, 52% men and 48% women within the Secretariat except uh, they're not at leadership levels. The women are still only at 28 and 18 percent in terms of leadership. So what do you think the challenges that you're going to face are going to be, uh, A? Secondly, how do you plan to overcome those challenges? And thirdly, could we get uh, any insights into that survey in 2018 on sexual harassment in the workplace? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, dear Heidi. Um, Okay, that's uh, another question as a head of delegation of France. Uh, Serene Mogon, please, dear Serene. Floor is yours. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Premier Ministre, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, je vous remercie pour vos interventions. Le contexte stratégique actuel est source d'inquiétude. La fin de l'été dernier du traité FNI, élément central de l'architecture de sécurité et de la stabilité stratégique en Europe, y accroît les risques d'instabilité et érode le système international de maîtrise des armements. La question de la prolongation au-delà de 2021 du traité New Start est aussi posée. Nous sommes directement concernés à un triple titre. Certains annoncent un monde structuré autour de deux grands pôles, 
dont aucun n'est l'Europe, or fonder cette nouvelle architecture de confiance et de sécurité en Europe ne doit pas cette fois se faire sans nous tous. Il appartient à tous nos États membres d'agir pour restaurer progressivement la stabilité stratégique dans notre espace. L'OSCE est incontournable à mes yeux. Avec la charte de Paris, c'est cette dernière dont nous célébrons le 30e anniversaire qui a ouvert la voie à l'édification d'une nouvelle architecture de sécurité et de confiance, y compris avec la Russie. L'OSCE est d'autant plus incontournable que cette architecture de confiance et de sécurité renouvelée doit s'ancrer dans la dimension humaine de nos relations, car l'Europe, c'est aussi un héritage commun de valeurs et de principes. Or, cette dimension humaine est indéniablement une force dans notre organisation et notre Assemblée y contribue de manière déterminante. Il me semble que cela doit être au cœur de notre message politique de porter à la fois l'esprit et le sens d'Helsinki, l'esprit et le sens de la charte de Paris. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, dear Sirin. Uh, and uh, now it's uh, our colleague, Mr. Kerry Dottel from Canada. Is it right? Thank you very much. Uh, this is to the chairperson in office. Um, Canada, as you know, has strong ties with Ukraine, and many descendants of Ukrainian immigrants live in the riding that I represent in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, as stated in the program of the Albanian OSCE Chairmanship 2020 document, the crisis in and around Ukraine, remember, remains the most pressing security challenge in Europe. Now, we in Canada have also uh, consistently and firmly condemned Russia's illegal annexation and occupation of Crimea, as well as ongoing support to the insurgency in eastern Ukraine. Unfortunately, despite efforts to strengthen democracy in Ukraine, and to work toward a resolution. The conflict in the Donbass continues, and Crimea remains occupied. We still have a lot of work to do. Could the chairperson please elaborate on the plans to de-escalate and resolve the crisis in and around Ukraine, and the strategy to make progress in 2020? Thank you very much. And the last question will be from uh, Nabi Avci from Turkey, head of delegation, please. Mr. Archie. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to draw the attention of our meeting to a very sad incident. The Highness attacks yesterday in Hanau, in Germany, are another horrible example for the rising xenophobia and Islamophobia in some parts of the OC area. We condemn this attack in the strongest term. We cannot see this attack in isolation. No, we can take it as something exceptional. It is high time that we say stop to these attacks. Time has come where all OSEC participating states must unite against xenophobia and racism. We must speak with one voice. My question goes to you, Mr. President, and your Secretary General, Mr. Secretary General. What can the OEC and OECPA Parliamentary Assembly do more in the fight against intolerance, discrimination, and xenophobia? Do you consider to make a joint statement condemning this heinous attack and its causes that has occurred in the eve of our meeting? Thank you. Well, I think no more questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Avci, for your position. I think we'll share that. And now I'd like to ask uh, Secretary General and Deputy Minister to respond to the questions. I don't know who will start. Uh, there was a one question to you. Maybe you will start. Thomas. Who? There were two to me, so I have no problem. Yeah, Why don't you yeah okay. okay. Please. Thank you all for the questions and comments. I would like to address the question from the colleague from Finland uh, first on cybersecurity, especially as related to 5G technology. And you closed on a very, I think, relevant point for all of us, um, which is the, the question was, are we too naive? 
I think that looking at it from a smaller country perspective, the question also continues in are we too small and then goes into are we too poor. Collective security is something that countries that have more limited uh, resources can contribute little to, but have to learn uh, more from multilateral uh, bodies and organizations, especially those specialized in security. And this is something that Albania, and here I'm speaking from our individual, uh, our individual perspective and experience, is trying to learn. So this is a very, very compelling point right now, as we are on the brink of this this new technological uh, revolution and for countries such as ours, even in the region such as the Western Balkans, there is very limited uh, capability to control information and also to address some of these greater issues. So I think it's one of the main focuses, not just of the presidency, but one of the main points on agenda of every president, I mean, chairmanship of the OSCE, to look specifically at cybersecurity and the threats it brings forward on, on collective security and what we as a body of particip participating states can do together in order to, to counter this. I think some of the questions we are still trying to answer, some of the answers that we have so far have to do with the immediate relevance of these technologies, especially in countries that have no means of controlling all the gateways to, to the information. We made a very specific step, but we are still very open to hearing all the other sides uh, as to this specific, uh, specific issue. But at the same time, it's something that is necessarily much bigger than a country of the size of Albania, or I think even of a country the size of Finland. It's something where we have to reflect collectively at what is open data and what is open source, and then at the same time, and where this intellectual property basically blends into national security concerns. And I think it's something very re that is becoming ever more relevant. We had to take a very quick step, but we're still looking at the process and trying to understand how best to, to react to this. And as far as the question from the colleague from, from Canada, one of the, it's, it's true, as you said, the top priority of the presidency is to, to try and de-escalate and hopefully ultimately resolve the conflict in and around Ukraine as it is the most pressing, uh, the most pressing challenge in the OSCE. So we did not come with a, with a pre-made solution. So for the past year, as we were part of the Troika and also now since the chairmanship has become has begun, one of the main issue, one of the main focuses for us is trying to understand the crisis in and around Ukraine. And the chairman in office, our prime minister, has already been on the ground in Ukraine and on the ground uh, in the crisis regions in trying to meet with different parties and understanding what the immediate implications are um, as we are trying to propose solutions for de-escalating de the crisis. Um, in our, in our, in our discussions, one of the, me the, the, the most prominent issues was the special monitoring mission, which I think, in which I think the OSCE even during the present, uh, the previous chairmanship has done an incredible work uh, in supporting on the ground and they themselves have done uh, some very good good work on the ground. The mission requires necessary conditions as well as support and resources to be able to fully uh, implement its, its mandate. So the Prime Minister also visited Eastern Ukraine to see the security and humanitarian uh, situation there on the ground in the, all the conflict uh, conflict touched areas, especially in Stanitsia, Luhanska. And I think that 
some of the achievements of the special monitoring missions are a very good example of, of what can be achieved with political will and a multilateral approach. Albania will continue to, to promote this approach of dialogue and the, chair, the chairman in office, our prime minister, will very soon, meaning next week, travel also to Moscow to start the discussion on both sides in trying to understand the issue better as we progress with bringing forward um, solutions and possible alternatives. So it's, a, it's something that we are working on. We will, we, conti we will continue to act very actively work on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please, dear, dear Thomas. I think you will respond to a few questions. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I try to. Uh, I have taken careful note of all your comments and, 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 and questions. Uh, I know that you are all under terrible time pressure, pressure because there are lunches uh, evading you. So I'll try to be very brief. And uh, if you want to know more on a given uh, subject, please feel free to approach uh, me. I'm going to be around uh, in the next couple of days. So very briefly, we appreciate very much Kazakh's uh, strong contribution uh, uh, to the uh, OEC um, and historically speaking, of course, facilitating the Asana Declaration of 2010. Uh, I think this uh, is an important document. And as I said in my remarks, uh, I think we should use the anniversary uh, of this uh, document uh, to not only commemorate but also reinvigorate some of the key concepts uh, that uh, the Asana Declaration outlines. Um, I would also uh, add that the OEC, I think, in recent times has given more and more attention to Central Asia because we realize that there are important uh, uh, positive dynamics in that region. There is much more regional cooperation than in the past. Some countries have been undergoing amazing uh, transformations, and this is a process that we uh, would want uh, to support and consolidate. Um, I think the challenge is uh, a bit also to also walk the talk and to also uh, resource uh, these efforts uh, properly by our organization. Uh, a Romanian delegate has asked uh, what is being done to reform the organization uh, to make it more responsive uh, to uh, security challenges in the future. Uh, just uh, three quick uh, pointers. There has been a reform agenda uh, aiming at internal reforms that I have undertaken since I'm Secretary General entitled Fit for Purpose. Here we are looking at reforming the budget process at um, um, strengthening gender mainstreaming, at reforming um, human resource policies, uh, at improving uh, ICT uh, solutions. Um, I have conducted a thorough management review of the entire secretariat uh, together with uh, Ernst & Young. So this is the type of things that we are doing uh, under this heading. Uh, you referred to the panel of eminent persons. There is uh, currently a serious undertaking by uh, 15, 16 leading think tanks uh, to reinvigorate uh, our thinking on cooperative security that tries to give a follow-up to the panel of eminent persons of 2015. You will see first results in the coming uh, months. And a last point under the same, uh, to the same question, there is uh, clearly more strategic planning in the organization. There is also an opportunity to do more medium-term planning because we have now uh, championships in place, not only for next year, but also for 2022. And I think this provides us with an opportunity to do more strategic planning. I have also uh, uh, um, geared up uh, the Secretariat for supporting such a process by establishing a strategic policy support unit. And I, th I think it's fair to say that we have become uh, more st stronger in, in terms of strategic planning over the last uh, couple of years. Um, 
Very quickly, also three pointers on uh, uh, promoting the gender agenda. I have issued a gender parity strategy uh, last year. Uh, we are aiming at gender parity you may say only uh, for 2026 uh, and this has a clear reason and points to a huge challenge that we have. If you look at the figures in terms of contracted personnel in the OEC, we are doing not good enough but pretty good and the trends are positive. Where we face huge challenges is when it comes to um, uh, seconded positions. For instance, look at our heads of field missions. Here we have a huge challenge and this is why I try to be realistic in setting the target in 2026. But we also need your support. Uh, we need in particular, when we want to reach better results on second positions, we need your active support for doing that. Um, the second pointer, yes, indeed, we did uh, conduct a survey on sexual harassment in the organization. And clearly, uh, to tell you the truth, the results have been alarming. And we have produced a, a plan of action uh, uh, with, I think, a number of very significant measures uh, that are being uh, implemented. Again, it takes time. It also takes resources uh, to, to do that properly. Um, I think nothing speaks against uh, uh, um, sir, um, sharing the survey with you. I think uh, we can do that. Uh, uh, and, and the third pointer on the same issue, we have started serious work um, on uh, preventing sexual exploitation and, and abuse. Again, if you're interested, I can give you more details. Um, the French delegate uh, referred to an extremely important document, uh, and I would like to pick that up. Indeed, the Charter of Paris, it's the 30th anniversary. I think let's, again, I say the same as for the Astana Declaration. Let's use this not only to commemorate uh, this document, but also uh, uh, as a platform to reinvigorate some of the fundamental concepts that have been outlined 30 years uh, ago. And uh, my last remark is complementing on what my Albanian colleagues have said uh, on uh, crisis management uh, uh, regarding the crisis in around Ukraine. Uh, our main two management uh, crisis, conflict management tools are, as has been referred to this the special monitoring mission to Ukraine that is monitoring but also facilitating. You may have heard about the spike of ceasefire violations yesterday in the Lugansk area. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, it was the SNM that facilitated the local ceasefire yesterday at 12. So it's not only monitoring, not only telling you what is happening in terms of ceasefire violations, but it's also facilitating uh, windows of silence on the one hand, to make sure you know that electricity, uh, 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 power lines, uh, uh, water pipelines, etc., can be repaired, but also to make sure that local ceasefire violations don't spin out of control. And then there is obviously the OEC mediated trilateral contact group, where you have all five signatories of the Minsk Agreement sitting at the same type table every two weeks. And we are trying uh, uh, our best to mediate. Uh, uh, progress towards fully implementing the Minsk agreements. I think what can be said is that since last summer there clearly has been a positive dynamic instilled in the conflict resolution process, but of course we are uh, not there yet and there are still very important um, uh, obstacles uh, uh, to overcome. But what is fundamental that we also have now an engagement by the Romani for on the level of heads of states. And I think that is absolutely decisive if we want to see this process uh, um, uh, seen through. Again, from our side, we are going to do our utmost to be responsive to all uh, uh, the tasks that come out uh, of uh, um, this political uh, process. And I guess I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Thomas, for your comprehensive and very detailed answers. I think there might be other questions, but it's no time for that. As I said, it was closed, and you can 
also in a, in a written manner uh, send the letters uh, or questions to Secretary General or Chairman in office and it will be answered. So uh, I just uh, very briefly uh, like to respond to two, two things. One was a report from an state of Kazakhstan. I'd like to say that I'm also acting as a special rep. The Central Asia have been a few times also in Kazakhstan and we're supporting all the good reforms and important reforms that this country is carrying out at this moment. And of course we'll be very happy to see President Tokayev also as a guest in any of our meetings because he, he, he has a great input in a, uh, let's say, development of this organization and strengthening parliamentary assembly. So our doors are open. And uh, what Mr. Nabi Avci stated about the, the events that happened in Germany Yesterday, of course, you, you saw that you heard that emotionally we responded to that, but we have concrete mechanisms. One is a counter-terrorist committee, another is a special rep on anti-Semitism and xenophobia, Ben Cardin. So I think we'll figure out how institutionally to strengthen that efforts that we already have and also respond to this specific tragical case. So with this, dear colleagues, thank you very much. Thank you. Deputy Minister, thank you all ambassadors, all our colleagues and of course interpreters to having this overtime work here and thank you all. We will continue now with the side events and then uh, tomorrow with, uh, and of course today with the two committee meetings. So thank you very much.